This is Talking Rackheads. Welcome to Talking Rackheads, episode 9. Uh, last week's episode, number 8, was all about one specific module, the Phrase Seek uh, 16. And that I got a lot of positive uh, responses from. People enjoyed the idea of just looking at one topic over an entire uh, Talking Rackheads. And so I thought I'll take the same approach this week. Um, a little different, but basically the same. So what is this week's topic going to be? Well, it's all about these. What are these? These are all utilities. And there are a whole bunch of utilities in VCV Rack. Most of which... Many of them we don't actually use or even know they exist. And if we do know they exist, what do they do and how do we use them? Well, that's what I'm going to try and do today, is show you uh, as many of these as I can and show you what they do and how you can use them to really enhance your own patches. Now, I am not going to be able to cover all of them by any means. There's probably close to... 60 or 70 of them in total as we stand at the beginning of May. So I'm only going to cover a few and uh, just show you how I use them in my patches and what they do. And the vast majority of utility patches I use come from Freddy at AS. And so I will be covering a lot of his. But there are many others by many other developers and I really encourage you to explore them. And to find these utilities, very simply, just go to the plugin manager and literally go down to the utility tag at the very bottom. Click on it. And here are a whole bunch of utilities. These are all the various different utilities that are tagged as such in the plugin manager. And they all do different things and have different abilities. And some of them are really, really interesting to use uh, and do bring a real different feel to patches, bring some complexity to them that's easy to manage, allow you to do things like live performances very easily, uh, just be incredibly creative. So again, that's what we're going to cover today. Utilities, this is Talking Rackheads, the utility episode. So, for the first utility, we're going to look at a very, very simple one. In this case, the Mark II Triggers by AS. And that's this module here. And what does it do? Well, it's actually just a button. Or, in this case, two buttons. The buttons act as switches. You can use them to turn things on and off. So, for example... At the moment, I've set up a sequence uh, from the PS16 and it's playing two different voices, both using cornrows. So I'm going to use the CS80 waveform and then this sine wave, uh, sorry, the uh, sync wave from cornrows. So if I play them both together by unmuting the channels here, then you'll hear what they sound like, like this. That's the two pieces playing together. But I want to be able to choose which pay piece or which part plays at any time. So I'm going to use the mark to trigger to mute individual parts when I want them to. So I take an output from the first one and plug it in to the mute input on the console mixer. Like this. And then I'll take the second mute 
and plug that into the second out down here. So I've now got an out to the first mute and an out to the second mute. And I've labeled them lead one and lead two. And you do that just by rotating this knob and there's a whole set of preset names you can use. So now I've done that, I've actually got both parts muted. You see here, the mute buttons are on. So now I'll turn up the volume and instead of having to go up here and press the mute buttons, I can place this trigger wherever I want it in my patch so it's easy to get to and I can just press the button and it will unmute one of the two uh, voices like this. Or this. And that's really simple, you know, just press one to up mute and unmute, press the other to mute and unmute. But say I want both voices to mute and unmute at the same time. Well, that's really easy to do. All you do is take an extra output from the output here by pressing on a Mac, the command key, and on a Windows and Linux machines, the control key to give you a second cable like this, and just drag that to the mute. So now I've got two chords going to the same uh, button. And if I press the button, I can unmute and mute both voices at the same time. So that's a quick way of doing it. However, what if I want the flexibility of being able to mute them separately and mute them together when needed? Well, that's where the Triggers Mark II really comes into its own. So I'm going to take this cable and put it back down to the second button. So now each button controls one mute. And all I need to do to mute and unmute both at the same time is create another Mark II triggers like this. And I'm going to call that Pad 1, just for a name. And this time I'm going to take the output and plug it into the external input on each of the Mark II triggers here. So now what happens is when I press this button, it will be the equivalent of pressing both these buttons at the same time like this. And turns them both off. But I can still press this to get an individual voice. So that was quite straightforward and simple. But there's another little trick you can use too. Say I want to quickly switch between lead one and lead two sound in a mix. Well, all I do is unmute one of them like this and then press the pad sound here because what this will do is it will mute this one and unmute this one together at the same time, acting like a sort of flip-flop. So I can have one voice and then the other without there being any break in between like this. So there is voice one working. Now if I press this button, it will mute that one and unmute this one. which is great and you know, very useful. Uh, what if you want to automate this? Well, you can automate the pressing of this button just by sending it a trigger from a gate sequencer or you know the phrase 16, 16 can do it too. And how do you do that? Well, 
we've got a second gate output here. So I can take that and plug that into the external um, input from here. So what that's going to do, and you can see it's already flashing like crazy, um, because every one of these steps has got a gate. But if I turn off the gates and just make you know the first one on, second one off, third one off, fourth one off, fifth one on, six off, seven off, eight off, nine on, ten off, and so on. I'll just finish this off. Now, on every fourth or every first of the four groups of steps, what will happen is, you can see here, the pads are being turned on and off, which means it's rotating the sound every four beats. And it will sound like this. Again, very simple effect, but very useful. And because you can automate it, you can set up combinations of these things to do different jobs. For example, I can have another Mark II trigger here that will turn on these two and turn on another voice when it's pressed. But this one will only turn on these two and this one will turn on the three plus the other one. So you can add these things together and create these combinations of button presses to do automations in your mix um, that are controlled by trigger sequences, clocks, you name it. And you can do all these things just with a simple thing like a Mark II trigger. Here is the next utility. We're going to look at now the Mark I triggers from AS. Now, what's the difference between the Mark I and the Mark II? Well, the Mark II was a straightforward on-off switch. It basically, you press a button or you automate the button and it turns something on or it turns something off. It basically sends a trigger which has got a two-way state, on or off, or high or low. That's what it can do. The Mark I trigger is a bit different because instead of just sending one value, you can send any voltage from minus 10 to plus 10 out when you press the button. And so there are two buttons, a latch and a momentary. The momentary, when you press it, just sends it out very briefly. The latch turns it on until you turn it off again. So this is like basically sending a value, a voltage, to a specific input to get what you want. So how would you use that? Well, in this instance, what I've set it up to do is act as two volume controls. I've turned on the latch and they're both set for zero volume or zero voltage. Now, if I turn up this one manually, the bass drum, which is on channel eight, you can see I've connected the output from Mark One triggers to the volume input of the mixer on channel eight. When I turn this up, you'll hear the bass drum. And these two are connected to the first Mark I triggers from its output. So when I turn the volume up, you'll hear the sequence playing. Two sequenced voices here again, two corn rows, different sounds, you'll hear this. So now I've sort of moved my ability to mix volumes from the mixing desk next to whatever I'm working with. So again, this is very useful if you're doing a large patch and you don't want to keep moving your mouse backwards and forwards to wherever the console is. You can just set up these triggers and put them next to whatever you want to do or in a certain area where you've got things put together just so you can quickly do things. So you could turn up the volume of the bass drum like this. 
and then gradually turn up the volume of the Mark 1 triggers for the synth voices. So that's one thing it can do. You can also, because it's a switch, turn on and off the voice like mute. But this time, instead of muting the voice, it will make the voice go silent and then turn it back on again at whatever volume level you set here. So this can be to like a preset volume like this. And then you can change the volume. And using the external input, like we did before, to gate number two on here, which I've set up to turn on every four beats. Now the Mark 1 trigger will send that voltage for four beats and then not send it for four beats and so on. So that's a simple use of the Mark 1 triggers sending out voltages. But of course you can do lots of other things with it. For example, so now I've added another utility to this patch. And this utility is an attenuverter. So these are really useful little utility modules. There's several of them around. Um, this is the new one from AS. But also I use the Bafaco dual attenuverter a lot in my patches. Um, and what an attenuverter does is enable you to limit voltages or signals from either end. It's sort of like if the signal could go from 0 to 10, an attenuverter, attenuverter could limit it so it could only go from 3 to 6 or minus two to plus four. It's sort of like, is like, uh, again, like a limiter from both ends that you can use. So what would I use an attenuverter for in this patch? Well, as I showed you earlier, when you turn on and off the voltage in a Mark One triggers, you either get zero or whatever voltage is programmed here. So it acts like a sort of a mute but to a certain voltage when you turn it on and then mute when it's off. But say you don't want to do that. Say you want it to act as a volume control where it plays at one volume when it's off and then a higher volume when it's on. Well, that's where you use an attenuverter. So what I've done is I've taken the output from Triggers Mark 1 and put it into the upper attenuverter in this module. And there are two attenuverters per module in this one and then I've taken the output and sent two outputs to the level controls in the mixer for those two channels. Then what I'm going to do is turn the offset and what the offset does is it turns up the volume or the, the signal for a minimum of what it's doing. So I'm if I increase this a little bit that's sort of around about 30% of volume. So if it was like a volume control, it would be at number three. You know, zero, no volume, 10 max volume, three is sort of like you know, a third of the volume. Then I've turned the attenu uh, attenuation itself up to full maximum so that whatever I add to it now, from the Mark 1 triggers when I press this button will basically be this volume plus whatever this set sends out from here to the volume control. So basically we've got a low volume and when I press the latch button we'll get a high volume. And so you get that effect. And again we can 
automate that with a gate. So I'm just going to take again the gate number two from the PS16 and plug it into the external input, the trigger, for the Mark 1 triggers. And then we get volume changes in time with the sequence. And again, changing the total amount. So I'm adding two to whatever's coming out of here at the moment. So you can make them quite subtle changes. Or if I wanted the general volume, the low volume to be higher, I'd turn up the offset. And then I want a higher level of the change, increase the volts being added to it. So that's another way of using the Triggers Mark 1 as a sort of volume change in a mix. And again, automating it so you can have parts being louder and softer in a mix as you're going along, depending on how you want to balance them. And this gives you that ability to balance sounds in a mix and automate that balancing so you're not constantly moving sliders around for different parts of a particular song or a track or whatever you're doing. Another example of how to use this combination is I've taken the output and instead of going to the mixer desk, I've taken it to the mix input of the delay plus stereo effects module by AS. So at the moment, the mix is set to zero and I've set up a little bit of attenuation so there is a tiny bit of delay being added to the song, uh, to the synth tracks. But when I press the latch button, I'm going to add a whole bunch of voltage to basically turn this mix from from basically 1 to 10. So I'll have a tiny bit of delay and then a lot of delay when I press the button. And then when I turn it off again, it'll go back to being a small amount of delay like this. So there's a small amount of delay on the synth voice. And now I press the latch button and now the mix will go up to 10. Off. On. Off. On. And again, I can automate that by using the second gate or it could be an LFO or it could be whatever it happens to be, whatever you want to use. So now I'm automating effects on and off in a mix. And again, I can do the same with the reverb. Just take an output here from my reverb to the output here, turn down the mix, Here, when the trigger cuts in, there it adds reverb plus the delay. And if I make it completely attenuate down in no offset, then there's no delay and no echo except when the trigger is on. Again, if I use the offset here, I can add a little bit of delay and a little bit of reverb so it's not completely dry when it's turned off like this. So that's another way of using a Mark 1 triggers. And again, 10 inverters really useful utilities too and these can control all sorts of things um, but again just limiting the amount you attenuate something is really important because 
sometimes you could be sending an LFO to a filter and it keeps going way too high or way too open or closing too much and you use an attenuator to limit how much the LFO opens and closes the filter giving you the effect that you want. Okay, so now let's look at something completely different. The next utility I'm going to look at is another module from AS, which is a BPM delay or Hertz calculator. Uh, so, okay, what does that do? Well, it does several different things, and some of them which are not apparent when you first start using it. But what it's designed to do is take an input from a clock, for example, like here, at whatever tempo you set it to, 120 BPM, and tell you what settings you have to put into a delay unit, for example, to get the type of delay rhythm you want. Now, you know that sort of ping pong sound that I tend to use a lot? Well, that's basically a sound set up by at 120 BPM, having 375 milliseconds on one side, and 750 on the other. And if we look at the calculation here, 375 is here. You see that? This is a dotted eighth, and 750 is a dotted quarter. So those are the two types of rhythms I want, a dotted eighth note echo and a dotted fourth note echo, quarter note echo. And when I put those calculations in, I get that echo effect at 120 BPM where the sound bounces from left to right in a sort of rhythmic pattern. And it sounds a bit like this. So there's a bass drum. And now I'll turn up the delay so you can hear the delay working. except it's not. Oh, because I've turned the, mu the mix down. There we go. So you can hear that sort of dum ticka 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 dum. Right, so that's the sort of rhythmic pattern I wanted to go with that bass drum sound to give it a sort of driving effect using the echoes to create that. But the problem is this, when I change the BPM, I lose that effect. So say I move that to 140. See how I've lost that effect? It now just sounds like a whole load of mushy echoes. Not quite what I want. And if I move to something sort of strange like 132, it's sort of all over the place. And what the calculator does is automatically calculate. You see, it's looked at the clock and now works out it's 132 and gives me those values again that I need to input. So for an eight dotted eighth note trip, uh, dotted eighth note delay, I need 341. So I change this dial by holding down the command key to do gradual decreases or again, if you're on a Windows machine or Linux, it's the control key and just gradually reduce this down to 341. So that's one side done. And then the other echo that I want should be 684. So now I'll reduce this down to 684. There are, and now I've got that echo effect that I was looking for. Oh, sorry. 682, not 684. There we go. So 682 there, and 341 there. And now I've gone back to that rhythmic pattern, one. Dum, tick -dum, tick -dum, tick -dum, which is what I wanted. So this calculator allows you to work out all the different types of rhythms that you might want if you're using a delay unit, so you get the exact effect you want at whatever BPM you're running at. Very quick way of working it out, and I love this. I used to use a website to do this, 
and it would be a pain like, looking it all up. Now I can just quickly plug in the clock and I've got it. And, you know, again, if that's all it could do, it'd be great just by itself. But actually, you can do a lot of other things as well. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to um, turn off this drum sound. Okay, so that's the drum sound off, and I'm going to turn off the delay. Okay, so now I've got a drum here, but I'm using a clock at the moment to be the master clock for the system. But say I didn't want to use a clock, I wanted to use an LFO. Well, that's great, but a lot of LFOs don't have any means of knowing what the tempo is that you're outputting. So, for example, if I just take a square wave from here and feed that into the bass drum input here, and now turn up the volume, That's the speed of the LFO at the moment. And as I increase the frequency, it gets faster. But I've no idea what BPM that is. So how do I find out? Take an output from the square output of the tri-LFO, feed it to the input, and now it's telling me that I'm actually running my LFO at 162 BPM. And if I change the LFO frequency, it will calculate the new BPM. So now I know what the BPM I'm generating from the LFO is. There's 103. So that's one way of using it. But here's another way. Um, instead of using the LFO to be the clock, I'll go back to using the BPM clock and I'll set it for, say, 120. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to set up my, my LFO to basically pan left and right the sound in time with 120 BPM. So what I do is again take the output and reduce the volume here or increase the frequency I should say until it says 120. So now my LFO is running at 120 BPM. The same rate that the clock is running here. So now I can take an output from the LFO, feed it to, for example, the pan input of the uh, console mixer, What it's actually doing is it's sort of here it is going right left right left every 120 bpms every beat every two beats a second now say for example i want it to beat pan slower then i'll take a division of this say i want it to go at a much lower rate say 60 bpm then i just reduce this down until i see 60 bpm on the BPM calculator and it takes a little while for it to find it because it depends on the speed of the clock it's got to read so many to do it oh there's 30 well that'll do so now I know that this is panning at 30 BPM one quarter the speed of the clock and you can hear it panning left and right if you've got headphones or you listen to speakers you should be able to hear this it's panning left and right in time with the tempo of the clock. So I've now turned any LFO into a BPM LFO, where I can be set precise uh, frequencies to match the tempos that I'm using in my piece. And again, having done that, um, and I know what my values here are because I 
I use them all the time. So I'm just going to set this for 375 for my echoes. And 750 here. Because that's the values I know works for my rhythmic pattern that I like. 120 BPM. And now I can turn up the delay. And I get a nice little rhythmic pattern going with my bass drum panning slightly left and right and with some echoes going off at the same time. A little bit of reverb to fatten it a bit. Et voila! So that's the VPM delay utility. Really nice little utility. And this is a new one that, that AS has just released. Really, really useful little utility. And I find myself using this all the time to time things like LFOs, uh, any type of frequency where you want it to match the speed of your clock or be a subdivision of the speed of your clock. Um, then you can work out exactly what it is and program it from there onwards. And now it's time for an intermission and another of the excellent 10 minute module series by Barry White. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, Greg from Modular Curiosity. Hey folks, this is Greg from Modular Curiosity here to do another 10 minute And so here we are with a deep voice. We'll see how long this voice lasts. Can I make it through 10 minutes? 10 minute module might be just perfect for me. That might be as long as my voice will last. So today, I'm gonna look at the DMX drum machine from Drumkit. DMX, now DMX has some really cool uh, things like the, the bass drum, which makes sense. It has a trigger. Stop that for a moment. There we go. It has a nice uh, BD9 drum kit with a lot of different drum sounds, and it works the way you would expect. That you have a trigger input, and you select which bass drum sound you want, and you have an output. Works really well. Snare drum also works as you expect. You have a trigger input. You select what types of snares, and notice that they have two, so you can actually have multiple sounds in a single module. Closed hi-hat, yep, works the way you expect. Open hi-hat, yep, and they all look very similar. And then there's this guy. No knobs, no trigger, no select, just voltage per octave input and an output. What the heck is going on here? Well, let's listen to it. And let's see, since I need a voltage per octave, I think I'm going to use a dual attenuverter. And what I'm actually going to do is use a chromatic quantizer so I can hit those notes individually. And let's see what happens. I'm just going to use the offset here to, uh, to basically give myself some voltage, some voltage changes. And let's see what happens. I'm going to hold down the control key so I can move this very slowly. And that was it. As you can tell, they're sampled drum sounds. They sound really cool. But it's interesting, how do you trigger them if there's no trigger input? Or 
quilt. <laughs> I didn't realize that that first one was actually a, a double hit. Okay, so how do you trigger these? Well, you have to trigger them with voltage controlled octave changes. It's weird. It triggers on a change, which is very strange. But also, if you give it either a zero volt or a high voltage, there's no sound. So that means you could use a sequencer to go back and forth between some sounds. So let's try that right now. Let's go ahead and put a sequencer over here. I'm going to zoom in so we can see it a little better. And the way I like to set up sequences, actually gates don't matter because there is no trigger. You can get rid of the gates entirely. Uh, I told you what, I'll, I'll put the gates on so I can see when I'm stepping through, I can see what the speed is. Anyway, the way I like to set up sequences is I bring it down to one step and I get the first note. Now, even if I hit the first note properly, bringing these all down to zero, I'm only going to get one sound. It's not going to repeat because remember, if the voltage isn't changing, it's not going to give me a new sound. There, see, I have a sound, but it's not repeating. Well, this one is down to zero. So if I now give it two steps, see, because the voltage changes to something that can be heard here, something that can't be heard here. So now let's try to find that bass drum sound. Oh, there we go. Now, how about I, if I put a uh, hi-hat sound on the second beat? Oh, that's kind of cool. And now I get a third step. So let's put the bass drum back here. We're only hearing one bass drum because this is the same voltage as that. I have to give it four steps so that it changes back down. See, so what's hearing is bass drum, double hi-hat hit, bass drum, nothing. So what if I put that same sound here again? There we go, found it. I'm going to go five, six. I think I'll put uh, a bass drum back here. And maybe a hand clap on this one. seem to be beyond the range here. Let me come back down. It's in there somewhere. There we go. Well, how about we go to eight and I put another bass drum back here. Eight steps, we'll find the bass drum for beat seven. There we go. And now all we have to do is find something to put on eight. Let's just randomly go in there. There we go, and we have a, a 
cool rhythm. But you know what? We have multiple rows on our sequencer. So I could do something like this. And maybe put uh, on every other beat that has the bass drum here, put another, uh, another hi-hat. So I kind of have a consistent hi-hat. Let's see if I can do that. In fact, what I'm going to do is bring it back down to two steps. There we go. Four steps. And I'll put a double hi-hat here. Now that's a little repetitive. The idea was good, but let's, tr let's put something else on this beat. And maybe I'll put something on beat five. Interesting. So we can actually use the three levels of our sequencer and maybe three of these to get some really complex rhythms going back and forth. And it actually sounds pretty good because these are drum samples. But there's another interesting thing I came up with, just playing around with this. So what if I change the steps? Yeah. So if I change the steps, I get different rhythms. Well, I wound up doing that over here. Let's see. Where's the uh, the drum? So I put a, a, a drum sound here. I did the same thing. Uh, let's see. Is it this one? Yeah, it's this one. Where I have a whole bunch of drum sounds. In fact, before I turn that on, I'm going to pull that out. So there's my 8-beat weirdness. <laughs> well, what I decided to do is take every 16th beat run it to a sample and hold. So my sample and hold is going to give me a random voltage. And that random voltage I'm going to set to steps, which means I'm basically randomly turning this. And I also have a reset here, so it's going to stay in sync. So let's turn that up, and you'll find out when I get lower voltages, like that in the red, I'll have shorter sequences. And just for fun, let's add a little Detroit sequencer to it. Notice how we're getting these really interesting rhythms. And I think that's it for 10 minute module today. That is the DMX drum unit. A strange, strange little unit. No trigger, no knobs, just sounds. And sounds was triggered from differences in voltage per octave inputs. How strange. I don't think I've ever seen a drum module that works that way. But what an interesting sound. Okay, Nigel.
before my voice goes completely, that's 10 minute module for today. Hey folks, stay curious. See you next time. Thanks, Greg. Yet again, another excellent little short video about a truly interesting module. Thanks, mate. Really appreciate it. Okay, so let's get back to the plot. More utilities to come. The next utility I want to look at is what's called a sequential switch. And this is the sequential switch here from ML. What's a sequential switch? Well, it is something that can take multiple inputs, in this case, eight of them, and feed the results out of one output. And because it's a switch, these are not added together. You basically step through them manually by pressing the appropriate button, or you can feed it a clock or a gate or a trigger and step through them as you want sequentially. Now, there, this is an 8 to 1. There's also a 1 to 8 that Martin does as well, which is basically uh, one input going to eight different outputs, and that can have a lot of uses too. But for this example, I'm using the 8 to 1. And what I've done here is I've set up four different voltages coming from four different Mark 1 triggers. So here's a voltage of 0, a voltage of 2.5, a voltage of 4.7, and a voltage of 9. And I've taken the outputs and fed them into each of the first four inputs on the sequential switch. And I've set the number of steps to four, so it will only use the first four of eight possible inputs. Then I've taken the output and fed that to the waveform selector input, the position in the wavetable of the XFX wave, which is a wavetable synthesizer. I've also got a, a PS16 playing a sequence, which is coming into the volt per octave, and then the output is going to a stereo pair in the mixer with a bit of reverb and a bit of delay. So, let's have a listen to what input number one sounds like. And input number one being a zero voltage selects the first waveform in this particular wavetable, which I've chosen as the VS waves number one wavetable. Now if I click on button number two, it's going to instantly change the waveform to a waveform from the wavetable that's selected when I send it two and a half volts, like this. And then 4.7, like this. And then the last one is what I get if I put nine volts in. And to get the right waveform, all you do is move the voltage sector and it will change through the waveforms. So that's how you select the various waveforms. Just choose the correct trigger that you're using and rotate it round till you find the waveform you want from the wavetable. So what this has done in essence has given me a set of four presets to use in this piece. And this means that I didn't need to have four wavetable synths running at the same time. If I don't want them all playing at the same time, I can just use one wavetable and four presets for it, which is, you know, cool little idea. But of course, this can step through them uh, automatically. I'm just pressing buttons to do it manually. But I can set up the sequential switch to step through in time with my piece, be it a gate inputs, a trigger sequencer, or whatever else I want. And in this case, I'm going to take a gate 
from gate two of the PS16 and put that into the up input for the sequential switch. And you'll see as the piece plays through, it steps through the sequence of switches, which means that when you hear it, you'll hear it automatically changing waveforms in time with the piece. which is a, you know, a cool way of doing something. And we don't have to use sequential switches from straight gates. We can feed them in different sorts of gates. So for example, I'm gonna use a Bernoulli gate. So I'm gonna right click here, go to my audible instruments, find the Bernoulli gate here and feed that in. Then I'm gonna feed it a clock. So I'll use the clock for the beat output, for example, and take, instead of using the clock, the gate coming in from the phrase sequencer, I'm going to use the output B from, from the Bernoulli gate. And so it'll step through uh, with an element of randomness, probability, coming from here to sound something like this. It's still going in sequence, if you notice, but just not regularly going in sequence. And if I take a second out from here and feed that to the down position, now it will either go up or down, depending on what the outputs here determine. So now it's moving randomly through the sequence of switches. Sort of like a drunken walk or Brownian motion. So that's a sequential switch. And sequential switches have all sorts of kind of uses in patches. Again, I'm just using this to move through a wavetable. But you can actually set up four entirely different voices with four entirely different synths, with four entirely different filters and step through them in sequence as you're going through. Uh, or you could use just one uh, wavetable, but four different filter settings that you'll step through in time with the music as you're using it. Um, and again, sequential switches, they're really useful for doing all sorts of, of interesting uh, changing parts to a patch, where it's like setting up a whole series of presets and stepping through them as you go through your patch in time with, for example, a trigger from a trigger sequence or a clock from a very slow running clock will do the same thing. And don't forget what I said earlier. This is an eight to one switch, but you can also have a one to eight. So you could take one, say for example, C, uh, C, uh, volt per octave input, one tune if you like, and then route it to different sequences or sequences or different uh, VCOs, for example, or have multiple clocks coming in here routed to a sequencer. And as it steps through the sequence, it'll play at different clock speeds, whatever sequences connected to it, or have multiple VCOs for entirely different sounds that will step through as you go through the piece, but all playing the same sequence coming from a sequencer, for example. So there are lots of possibilities with sequential switches. And again, this is one of those really useful little utilities that once you understand how it works and how to play with it, you can get a lot out of it in your patches. Now again, for something completely different, I'm gonna show you a couple of utilities that help you clean up and keep an eye on your patches themselves. And the first one I want to look at is the tidy up cables 
from log instruments. And this is such a simple idea, but works really well. You've got all these cables flying around, and sometimes it's hard to remember what cable came from where and where it's going to. So what you can do, for example, here I've got a zero volt cable coming out of my TriggerSmart one and going to my sequential switch. And say I wanted to remember that that was the cable that was coming from the zero, the, uh, zero volt triggers. Well, I take the cable end and plug it into the first slot here and take the output and plug that where it came from. So now it's sort of interrupted the flow. And then here I can just click and type zero volt from MK1. And that immediately tells me when I look at this cable, oh yeah, that's the zero volt cable that's coming from the triggers to go to the sequential switch. And say the sequential switch was over here, for example, and not close to where the module is, you know, I could then type two uh, and then put sequential switch port one or port one like that. So now I've got zero volt from mark one to sequential switch port one. And I can look at that and instantly know that's where the cable goes to. And then I can move the rest of them out like I've just done. Just go here, here, and here, and take the outputs to here, here, and here. And I've got some sort of stuff coming from my Bernoulli gate, my up and down. So I'll take those here and put them in like this. And finally, I've got the output, which is going from the module to my XF, X wave. So I'll put that in here like that and run that to there like this. And now these could be anywhere on the screen, literally anywhere on the screen, away from these modules. And I can type in all the information that I need in these slots to remind me what they are and where they came from. So I can say sequential switch to uh, V opt in waves. And so when I come back to the patch later, and this is what often happens, I do a huge patch and then I can't remember how I cabled it up. I can quickly look at this and rather than trying to track where all these cables go and following them around the screen, I've got an instant reference of where each one went to and where what the purpose of it is. So I can quickly find that particular module as I need it and put them in wherever I want and just keep a written record of what each thing's doing. Really, really useful little module. The other module to help you clean up your patches is the snake from South Pole. And what the snake does is it provides you with a, like a pair of modules, or you can have however many you want, but say a pair of modules with inputs in one module and outputs in another, and you can plug in cables into one box and they automatically transfer across to outputs in the other box without there being cables in between. So you can get rid of these long cable runs that you've got across your patch just by using the snake to hide the cables, so to speak. So let me show you what I mean. I'm going to go and get hold of one of the snakes. So a right click at the top, type in snake. And here is the snake multi-core plugin by South Pole. There she is. And I'm going to duplicate it. So I've got two of them now. And say, for example, I want to get rid of this input, these inputs to my audio core audio card that are coming from this mixer desk over here. All I do is take one snake and put it next to the module and then take another snake and put it next to the other module. Then take the cables, the inputs, the out inputs here and feed them to the ends of this snake. And there's two little green lights come on 
telling me that these are inputs that are available and on here you see two red lights telling me that there are inputs on these two channels so I take the outputs from there and feed them in here and now there's no cable between here and here but they are connected by the snake and you can do this in lots of different ways for example this sequential switch has got all these cables coming to it so say instead of having the sequential switch with all the triggers over here I want it over this side of the screen because of the way I'm laying out my patch so what I do is move the things around like this you know just just move stuff how I want it like whatever like this and move my triggers over here like this okay so I've got all these long cables now dragging all over the place you see the the cables to the Bernoulli switches are all coming across my patch and everything else and all I do is insert a snake so here's a snake and because I don't want these to be related to these two because you can have not just a pair but you can have four snakes all with the same ID so that some outputs you can move to this one and some outputs you can move to this one I want these to be entirely separate so I give them a different ID I press this little button and now this is snake number one this was snake zero this is snake number one and I'll duplicate that and drag him over and put him in this little hole here so now what I can do is this long cable that's coming from the clock see here going into the Bernoulli gate I can take that and put that into input number one and on this snake take output number one and feed it into the clock and that gets rid of that one long cable and the same here I've got this little in output here running into the input of the XFX wave and I want to get rid of that so I'll create another snake number one like this put him over here take this cable here and feed that into output and I can't use one because it's already being used you see there's a little red light it tells me it's already being used so I'll use number two like this and then I'll take number two over here and feed that into the output sorry I put it in the wrong one feed that this output here which was coming from the output here I'm going to take that and feed that to an output here for example and then this input feed it into there and now this is going into here and then without a cable coming out of there and going into this waveform bit getting rid of that long cable and the same with the clocks here these clocks are getting in the way these two cables here a clock and a reset so again duplicate snake number one put him up there then these two cables right I can just take them and feed them into two different inputs on my snake here so I've taken the reset there and the uh, clock output into this one and take the equivalents from here and feed them into the clock and into the reset and I've got rid of that long cable across the screen and the final thing I want to do is take my two outputs from the um, wave and I'm going to take them from that and put them into here so they're coming from this snake and then take the two outputs from here and feed them into the equivalent inputs over here and now I've got rid of that long snake which means I can move my modules around like this um, tidying up my patches as I go along and I've got rid of all those long cable runs um, that were getting in the way of everything because everything's hidden and I can see where everything's going because I can look over here and say right snake number one there's an input coming from my beat clock where does it go on snake number one I look for the number one snake that's got an output there it is and it's going into my Bernoulli gate 
so I can instantly see how things are sorting themselves out and I can instantly clean things up. And this is such a great way of tidying up your patches. You have to be a little bit organized and sometimes I use this along with the tidy up cables to remind me of what the names of everything are when cables are around. But if you're doing very large patches and you don't want cables strewn everywhere, and yes, you can turn down the opacity, I know, but sometimes you want to actually see what cables are doing and how it's connecting together, then this is a really simple way of cleaning things up so that the patch still plays, but you're not trying to dig through all the different cables that are going on in your patch. This next utility is a very simple one, but is incredibly effective at helping you manage things like effects in your rack. And that is the send module, this one here, from Vault. And what it is, is it's a completely standalone send and return for an effect system that you can add to any particular voice or voices. So to show you how this works, I've created a little sequence that's running through the VC, uh, VX, X, FX wave. I'll never be able to say that properly sometimes. The XFX wave and then going through the Blamsoft and to the mixer. And it sounds sort of like this. And I've got a little kick drum just to let you know the beat as it's running in the background. Okay, so that's the basic synth part playing. Now, what I've done is set up an effects chain. A bit like a guitarist sets up effects pedals on the floor and then presses a button to add them. Well, you can do the same with the send. So what I've done here is taken the outputs from the filter and put them into the inputs of the send and return and then the outputs go to my mixing desk. So the signal comes out of the wave, into the filter, out of the filter, into the send, and then out from the send and back to the uh, mixing desk. So that's the chain as it's working at the moment. But what I've also done is taken the send outputs from the send and fed them into the left and right inputs of the delay plus stereo FX from AS and the outputs of those going to inputs of the MY Stereo Chorus from NISTI and then the outputs from that going back to the return inputs on the send itself. So here what we've got is a little loop of two effects modules going back and forth from the send module. Now at the moment the blend is zero minus over so all you're hearing is the unaffected part and as I rotate this knob you'll hear more and more of these two effects pedals with their own mix levels kept the same but added to the signal like this. There's the signal dry from these two effects and then just rotate around and add them. And this is an added advantage to typically the send and returns in a mixer or if your mixer doesn't have send and returns, then you can add as many of these as you want. And once you reach the center point here, that's an equal balance between the original sound and the affected sound. Now, as you turn to the right, less of the original sound will be here and more of the affected sound only you'll hear which can give some interesting effects like this that's it without and this is just the effects
and then this is halfway between the two. So just a really simple little module, but using these across the mix in different ways lets you add entire synth chain, uh, entire effects chains. You know, sometimes I've used them with four or five effects units, all linked together for one voice or for multiple voices. Because again, these um, inputs and outputs, this could come from your mixing desk into here first and then output back to another mixing desk or your audio card. So you can add entire chains of effects with their own mix levels set. And this is the important bit. You know, you set up the mix levels, if you can, in the modules for the overall balance of these effects between themselves. But this then becomes an overall FX uh, send and return. So it keeps the balance of the two, two or more effects, but allows you to increase the overall effect that the effects have on it. Wow, that was a mouthful. But anyway, so that's how you can do this. And of course, there's also a wonderful attenuation and input here. So you could automate this through an LFO or even a sequencer uh, emitting pitches, you know, voltages. So you could automate the sending uh, of the FX to this chain through uh, whatever means to match parts of your patch so you don't have to manually do it you can automate the whole thing so that's the send by vault really really useful simple little module but another one of these utilities that can add a lot to your patches so for the last utility uh, bit for this talking records this is not so much a utility, but just a little trick that I discovered. And I'm using the 12 key as a live keyboard. Now, if you remember from the last Talking Records, uh, in the Mega Patch at the end, I decided to try and play live over the top of an existing patch using the 12 key. And that worked great. But one of the things that I had a problem with was that I wanted to bring some more expression to the uh, lead part and you know it's difficult with a virtual keyboard because you only got one mouse to play one thing at one time and I wanted to add something like vibrato to the sound but that would mean moving down to another set of controls and then moving back to the 12 key and that never works very well in reality when you're trying to play so I came up with this little weird idea um, and what I've done is I've used the gates here from the 12 key to trigger envelopes. And the envelopes are set. So I've got a very slow attack envelope, which then goes to a VCA, which opens the LFO slowly. So what's basically happening is when I send it a certain gate, the envelope will open slowly, opening a VCA, which is working like an attenuator, which then allows more and more of the LFO to affect the pitch of the noxious, which is what I'm using as my VCO. So how does that work with a 12 key? Well, because of the way the 12 key works, if I click a note, I get a straight note and the gate doesn't stay open it closes straight away. But because this is a long envelope sound, the sound keeps playing like this. And I've got a bit of echo and I've got a bit of delay on that. And that's great. But now I want to bring in that vibrato. So because, again, the way the 12 key works, if I click on a note and then click and hold on the note, 
that will open the gate which will keep the gate open and allow the VCA to trigger. So then you can bring in uh, vibrato after the note and it will build up and then when you release the note it goes away again. Also while you're holding down the mouse button you can move the mouse to another key so you don't have any gaps between this happening. So to show you that working, let me just do this little quick demo with the vibrato now working. So again, if I click on a note and just click on it, I don't get vibrato. But if I click on a note and then I hold on the note, there's the vibrato kicking in. And if I move my mouse, I can click on the next note. So now I'll play that little Vangelis piece again and you'll see how the vibrato works. hold down Simple as technique, but works great and means you can add vibrato or whatever else you want to bring in. It could be a filter opening. It could even be pitch bend if you wanted to. All by just using one mouse and the way that you click on the keyboard. So, that brings us to the end of another Talking Records. Hope you enjoyed this edition. Um, a bit different, I know, just lots of little things about utilities. And this will not be the end of utilities, I'm sure, because there are literally tens and tens of these utilities that I'll do another episode like this in the future. Um, but just thought that some of these little utilities that often get overlooked, you might find uh, useful learning a little bit about them and hopefully it'll inspire you to use more and more of them in your patches. So... What have we got for the Mega Patch playout for today? Well, this is something a little different. I was asked to write a piece of music that was random and tried to evoke the feeling of fish swimming deep down in an ocean. I don't know if I achieved that, but what I do like about this piece is that it has a very sort of almost orchestral feel to it and it's using the PS16s to generate random notes with random uh, uh, gates and again using the Bernoullis in my tried and tested way of generating sort of slightly random rhythms to everything and it's just four voices all using cornrow X's to generate the string type sounds using knobs to merge them together and some diode ladder filters just to take the edge off everything. Um, that's really all this is. Just a very simple but self-generating sort of type piece that will play forever and constantly produce different sounding music. So, hope you enjoy it. Have a great couple of weeks, guys. As always, um, thanks so much for all your comments and criticisms they're all welcome i promise you and uh, i will look forward to seeing you again in the next edition of talking rackheads <laughs>